Lecture 12 is about some common distributions and is our last mini lecture for this week. We're going to focus on just three of them, binomial distribution, Poisson distribution and log normal distribution. Um, but we're going to see that uh, once we now know how to handle a probability density function, we can use any distribution that comes along. We know how to find its properties. We know how to interrogate it to find the probabilities of things happening. So you can see on this plot here, on this diagram, many of the ones we've seen already, a uniform distribution for a discrete case. We've seen that, for example, when throwing a die. A binomial transfer, uh, distribution, which we'll see, another discrete one. An exponential distribution, that's continuous. Normal distribution, which you're very familiar with. We're going to look at the log normal distribution. So there are many distributions, but once you get familiar with how to use one distribution, then you've learned the techniques that you need to work with any other distribution. So first we'll look in detail at the binomial distribution. And just for this one, uh, we're going to look at how you can you derive what the distribution is. So all of these distributions that we saw are mathematical um, entities which you can either invent as um, something out of interest uh, or which can be derived to represent a particular type of occurrence. And the binomial is derived to represent the situation where you're interested in the number of times an event A occurs in N independent trials. So it's very useful to know as this will enable us to calculate the probabilities of an event happening. So we say the probability of event A is equal to P and therefore the event not occurring will occur with the probability of the complement of A Q which is equal to 1 minus P. A either occurs or it doesn't occur. So if it occurs in the probability P the probability of it not occurring will be equal to 1 minus P. We assume that all the trials are independent so that means that uh, the second trial doesn't depend on the first trial, each time the probabilities will be the same. And in n trials, the random variable of interest x is the number of times that event A occurs in n trials. I think you'll have seen this before, but we want to make sure that you understand how to derive such a distribution. So A happens x times, each with a probability p, and B happens B, which is the complement of A, happens n minus x time each time with the probability of 1 minus P. So the probability of an event occurring is equal to the number of ways that that event can occur multiplied by the probability of any one occurrence. So we can split the probability of the event into those two parts. So with one occurrence it doesn't matter which order it happens in, it's just one occurrence where um, event A occurs. So that's the probability that A happens x times and the probability, uh, so the probability that A happens x times and that B happens n minus x times. So the probability of x happening was p, the probability of b happening was q, which equals 1 minus p, and they're independent trials. So to find the probability of one thing happening and the other thing happening, we can just multiply them together. So we multiply p together x times, and we multiply q together n minus x times, and that's all multiplied together. And that becomes p to the power x multiplied by q to the power n minus x. So that's the first part, that's the probability of any one occurrence happening. So how many different ways can A happen x times in n trials? Now we can use the permutations that we've studied already. So in this case there are two classes. We have n trials and there are two classes, so C is equal to D, and the two classes are A or B. So A is where A happens and B is where A doesn't happen. The number of times that we get A is X and the number of times we have B or the number of events in B is N minus X. 
So we remember that we had a result for that, a permutation of C classes of equal things within N things is equal to N factorial divided by N A factorial multiplied by N B factorial. And so we can substitute in our values N A is X and N B is N minus X. So now we can write the probability of our event is equal to this probability distribution where we have our n factorial over x factorial n minus x factorial term here and we have our p to the x q to the n minus x term here and that's called the binomial distribution so it's a probability distribution it's discrete and if you sum all of these terms then you would end up with a total over the total event space it would be equal to over the total sample space it would be equal to one and this first term you know we write often as this n choose x so an example of that the event is rolling a six the probability of rolling a six is equal to on a die is equal to one sixth and on this occasion, um, the problem is, what's the probability of obtaining at least two sixes when rolling a die four times? So the probability of not getting a six is five sixths. The event is rolling at least two sixes, and so the outcomes that make up that event are rolling a two or a three, so rolling two, three, or four sixes. So all of those would satisfy our criteria, so all of those would be in our event. So the probability of our event of rolling at least two sixes is equal to the probability of rolling two sixes plus the probability of rolling three plus the probability of rolling four. So we can do that for each time. We have four choosing two, four choosing three, four choosing four. The probability of getting the six is one sixth and the probability of not getting a sixth is five sixths. So we could substitute those in to our binomial distribution, add them up, add up each of the discrete parts of the distribution for our events and we get the probability is about 0.13. So our second distribution then is the Poisson distribution and this is a limiting case of the binomial distribution. So the binomial distribution had um, n events, sorry n uh, trials and there was a certain probability of our event for each trial. So the Poisson distribution takes the situation where the number of trials tends to infinity and the probability of our event in each trial starts to tend to tends to zero. So that's like a die which gets more and more and more and more and more sides to it. If you had an infinite sided die, the probability of any one face being rolled would be would tend to zero. So as the number of sides increases, the probability of that side being rolled obviously decreases. So when we say it's the limit, this is the binomial distribution. And so we have n tending to infinity and we have p tending to zero. And if you follow the link or if you search for that, you can find the result that this um, limit is equal to this function here, which is what we call a Poisson distribution. We can use our definitions of mean and variance to find that the mean of the Poisson distribution is equal to mu and its variance is also equal to mu. Our final distribution is the log normal distribution and this is one that doesn't have a or its application is often without a, uh, a particularly scientific basis but it is often found to fit what data looks like. So you can see this expression here is familiar to you with the normal distribution, except that x has uh, been replaced with lun x. We've taken the log of the variable x. 
and within this uh, mu is the mean and sigma squared is the variance. So you can see for different means and variances the distribution looks different. In this case the mean is zero in each case but as the variance changes the shape of the distribution changes and the log normal tends to end up with a skewed distribution and often this is used to describe particle size distributions so this is a paper which reported some data where the log normal probability density function was used um, to represent that data so there's not a fundamental proposal here of why the log normal should fit this data it's just observed that it often does fit particle size data and so we can use this then as a model to represent what the probability function is for the data that we're looking at. That sums this up. You can use sets techniques for all the different types of distributions that you'll come across and the example problems that we've got this week will test you on some of those. The next lecture will take us into the sampling of distributions and we're going to look at the confidence intervals of means and the confidence interval of a variance from a given sample. Thank you.